Welcome back, everyone. Great to have you here. Can't wait to get into this weekend's Cabral Host Calls. You know this is our time to be able to answer our community's questions from far and wide all around the world. Uh, we get to so many great questions every Saturday and Sunday. I try to get to six questions each day. So we answer a dozen questions on Saturdays and Sundays, and they are always answered in the order they come in. So now that you've heard the typical weekend spiel of how all of this works, I'd love to be able to spend our time dissecting these questions, really going deep in them and making sure people get the answers that they deserve. So I always have to give you just one disclaimer that podcasts are not for giving medical advice. So I'm not providing any medical advice, any diagnosis, any treatment or cure of any disease. Because of course, you know, what I do is I share with you the underlying root causes of why dis-ease even begins in the first place. So having said all of that, why don't we dive in? First question today, and again, I don't even prepare for these questions. I don't even look at the questions. These are based on 20 plus years of practice and clinical practice and uh, working with hundreds of thousands of people. All right. So Christine is up first. Hi, Dr. Brawl. What do you think about eating for your blood type? I've been reading the book, Eat Right for Your Blood Type and find it particularly interesting. Any comments on or thoughts on this? All right. So Christina, I've answered this before. And I always like to direct people to podcasts that I've done before because I, I just I like to keep a running dialogue of, of everything that I've done and uh, people can just search it. So that's at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. So we're going to go right over and you're just going to type in blood type. And if that doesn't narrow it down, we're going to do blood type diet and we're going to get you your uh, answer. All right. So blood type diet was on, talked about on 1856, 1044. 583, 485, 281, looks like the main one was 281, 2164, 2111, 2183, and I would do, if I were you, because there's a bunch of shows that go over blood type diet, so what I would do is start with episode 281, blood type diet, all right? So just a, a little note, I always like to share this, that I actually... Um, went up and uh, worked with the, I didn't work at that place. I didn't work at the Dadamo Center, but I met with the Dadamos at the Dadamo Center. It's a really nice uh, clinic. I believe it still exists in Port Smith, New Hampshire. And uh, great people, very smart people, very caring, nice uh, staff there, nursing staff, the doctors that are there, really great. What I don't believe in though, is one particular diet because there are so many facets of that. Meaning you can't eat right for your blood type when you have candida overgrowth or parasites or whatever, right? So you're rebalancing your body. And then there might be, not might be, then there is some truth to that as well. Um, I've certainly gone in depth on that on the previous podcast. I'm going to have you check out that show. But no, I don't recommend uh, people necessarily follow to a T the eat right for their blood type. Because again, we could go down a rabbit's hole and um, there's so much that takes into account. Seasons, Ayurvedic dosha type, your current condition, etc. All right. Ryan's up next. Hello, I've been wondering if you know anything about the approximate ratio of black pepper to turmeric that is needed to get the benefits of bioperine. Uh, oh, that's a good question. I don't want to get too much into the micro here, but also would like to know practically if a tiny grind from the shaker is enough or if a larger amount is needed. Thanks in advance. Okay. So there's actually a, a there's a, there's a, a difference here and I think you pointed it out. So bioperine is the clinical amount that you need in order to absorb something like turmeric in order to really extract like the curcuminoids. And let me see, I don't believe I have it right here, our cell boost. Let me look up our cell boost, all right? Because it has that exact amount. Because I actually went over this with one of the scientists uh, when I was formulating this. So let's just go to equi.life. And then in the search box, I'm just going to go to cell <clears throat> boost. I'm going to click on that. And then I'm going to click on the label. And oh, the bioperine is in the anti-inflammatory. That's just dawned to me. It's in the inflamasooth because of the herbs, of course. The cell boost and the inflamasooth are great together, which is why it's our advanced renewal system. But we're going to click on inflamasooth, which has the one gram of turmeric. And um, the bioperine is 10 
milligrams. So um, that's the extract, which means you're going to need obviously much more in order to get that. <clears throat> now, if you think about it, that's quite a bit. You know, that would be quite a bit of black pepper. There is going to be no naturally consumable amount uh, to get to 10 milligrams of black pepper. Your entire food coating would be black pepper. So just letting you know, there's not going to be a good equation. It'd be inedible. It really, it really would be. It would be, I mean, I love pepper on my food. I really do. I'm, I'm a spices kind of guy. I very much enjoy it. Black pepper has a lot of antioxidants as well. I like to put it in fish and things like that, but it would not be consumable, the amount of black pepper. It's like, <clears throat> you know, it's like red wine. You know, you need to drink uh, David Sinclair says like 200 glasses. It's, it's probably not 200 glasses, but you know, it's gonna be like 20 glasses. It's gonna be a lot of glasses of red wine. So, um, there's no direct equivalent. So the best that you can do is you will use black pepper if you're using things like curry or your turmeric, and that's, that's going to be your best bet. But the direct equivalent, I'm sure if I did some research, I'd be able to figure that out. But at 10 milligrams of the extract, 10 milligrams of black pepper is a lot of black pepper. Like that's all that would, and it would, couldn't just be black pepper because it's the extract of the black pepper. So you might be talking about 10 times that amount um, if you're not using the extract. All right. It's a good question. I've never been asked that before. Cindy's up next. Hi, Dr. Ball. Listen to episode 760 on killing viruses. It talks about the need to ramp up the immune system. However, I have an autoimmune thyroid issue called Hashimoto's, and I was told to avoid things that ramp up my immune system because the immune system has already gone rogue and it could cause the body to attack itself even more. For instance, I read to avoid echinacea and holy basil. Can you clear this up? Because I certainly would like to support my immune system without causing issues with my autoimmunity. I listen all the time, so thanks for your help on this issue, Cindy. Cindy, happy to help. Thank you for writing in. Well, this goes back to the fundamental issue that you shouldn't have an autoimmune issue in the first place. Now, again, easier said than done, right? I used to have rheumatoid arthritis, so I, I certainly can relate to you, Cindy. I totally get it. Um, so there's something called TH1 and TH2 immunity. And you seem like you might someone right now that has a higher ramped up TH1. So TH1, though, kills those viruses and, and uh, acute-based issues where TH2 is more of like the, the pain in the butt one, where it's uh, allergies and, you know, inflammatory and mastocytosis and uh, chemical sensitivities, brain fog, like all those. So um, here's the issue, though, is you want to rebalance your body so you don't have the autoimmune issue anymore. Like that's, that's the goal, right? The goal is don't worry about ramping up your immune system because the goal is to get rid of the autoimmune issue in the first place. So we help people with Hashimoto's all the time. Again, not here to diagnose, treat, or cure any disease. We look at the underlying root cause of why someone has Hashimoto's. That, that's it. We like literally figure out why did this person develop Hashimoto's? I have a whole course on it. It's at stephencabral.com forward slash courses. You can click on the thyroid one. I have a free podcast on thyroid. You can go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast, scroll through the images in the top, click on the thyroid. There's like 30 to 40 shows just on the thyroid. We can teach you how to rebalance the body so that an autoimmune issue can't exist. Like that's the goal. I mean, that is the goal. So I like to keep going deeper. So I wouldn't worry about the echinacea. Yes, it can start to ramp up TH1 immunity, but we need to, we need to rebalance the body. We need to get rid of the autoimmune issue in the first place. That's, that's the true uh, root cause. All right. Liz is up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. Thank you for putting so much time and effort into your podcast. It's clear that you have a drive and a need to help people themselves, help people help themselves. Thank you, Liz. Yes, that is the goal. My goal is, in the words of Dr. Andrew Saul, to doctor yourself, right? He wrote a book. I've talked about that book before. I want people to doctor themselves. Yes, they can still, of course, work with their medical doctor. They should. And they should work with an integrative health practitioner. But I want them to have the access to the answers and to begin to implement this for themselves and their family. All right. Uh, Liz says, I've learned a lot over the past couple of years. My question is, what do you think of uh, fucoxithin? Supplements to aid in fat loss. I think I answered this. Did I answer this? I don't know. I haven't been able to find a lot of information on it, but what I've but what I've seen has been promising. It's hard to find though, and I question the quality of the supplements I've been able to find. Is I don't even know how to pronounce that word. It's it ends in xanthan, so it's an antioxidant, and typically that means it's from well, it's it's a particular color, probably like from an algae. And if so, how do I find a source I can trust? All right, like I said, I've never looked things up on the podcast, but 
I also don't like being stumped. So I feel a little stumped. Let's see what this is. I feel like I answered this question just like last week or the week before. I don't know. Um, it's found as an accessory pigment in chloroplasts of brown algae and other uh, heteroconauts, giving them the brownish green color. Well, there you go. So it's a very powerful antioxidant. All right. So, uh, well, it's possible that it aids in fat loss, but it's certainly not something that I've seen a lot of research on. And so I don't use it in my practice. And again, I just have the weird feeling that I just answered this over the last couple of weeks. So I apologize if I've already answered it. But if I, let's assume that I haven't. And it's okay if I answer it twice, right? So here's the thing we know things that truly help us lose weight. And I list them on the Fatlocity page. So again, you don't have to purchase the Fatlocity weight loss system. You can read about though. And you can also listen to my podcast on weight loss. So we know that thyroid, adrenals, thermogenesis, estrogen progesterone ratio, testosterone, DHA, all those matter, um, and blood sugar balance, as well as your sleep are critical for losing weight, right? So let's do those things first. This is an icing on the cake type thing. I talk about this quite a bit, right? It's like, if you're tired, don't take CoQ10. I'm a huge fan of CoQ10. We have a new product, Advanced CoQ10, 100 milligrams of ubiquinol, easy to absorb. It's an amazing product. But if you have energy issues, don't start with CoQ10, even advanced CoQ10. Start with figuring out, is it your thyroid, your adrenals, your hormones, right? Like go for the foundation. This product is not a foundational product that helps your body lose weight. It is an icing on the cake if it works. So if it's legitimate, then it's an icing on the cake product. That's how we look at it. Meaning like CoQ10 matters. And after you fix your HPA access, your thyroid, your hormones, your blood sugar, anything to do with your energy, okay, then sure, you can supplement with advanced CoQ10, uh, Cell Boost, and the others as well, right? So that's how I look at it. It's icing on the cake. And it's great to do, but I just don't know that product, and certainly I wouldn't lead with it. All right, Bob's up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. Love the podcast and your unbiased approach to everything you cover. I know you have a lot of content on intermittent fasting, so I apologize if my question's already been answered. But I'm wondering, what breaks a fast when doing intermittent fasting? I'll start my morning with some organic, non-caffeinated herbal tea, typically some roasted dandelion or rose hips or hibiscus, lemon ginger, uh, plus probiotics from Bigelow. I don't think I know them, but I don't know. Maybe they're great. What would break my fast? Also curious about supplements. Would taking a supplement pill first thing in the morning or at night uh, before bed break a fast? Great question, Bob. And I have an exact 20, you are right. I have a 25-minute podcast dedicated to this, and I'm going to find it for you. I promise that. So stevencabral.com forward slash podcast. And we're going to go to what, we're literally just going to type this in, what breaks a fast? And I think it's called what breaks a fast or what doesn't? Let's just see, though. All right, 1965. What foods and drinks don't break a fast and what do? All right, so there it is, 25-minute podcast, or 20-minute podcast, sorry, I don't do 25, uh, dedicated to our friend Bob. Head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 1965, and it will tell you exactly what does and what doesn't and what teas do, what teas don't, what coffees do, what coffees don't, et cetera, all right? So check that out, Bob. If there's any additional questions, <clears throat> write back in, let me know. All right, Crystal is up next. Hi, Dr. Wall, I'm 25, and I've struggled with my weight my entire life. When I was in high school, I got very slim, but then gained over 100 pounds between ages 19 and 20. I was then diagnosed at 20 with PCOS, which has resulted in chronic dry eye syndrome and hypothyroidism. I went vegan shortly after I was diagnosed for ethical and health reasons. I was able to lose the majority of the weight, but in the past year, I put a lot back on. Even with listening to your previous podcast on PCOS, doing the slow weighted workouts, and stuff, Slutty, slow and steady cardio with balanced high protein meals. The weight doesn't want to shed. I'm at a loss for what to do, and I was wondering if you could recommend a certain diet and protocol. I wanted to mention that because I'm vegan and aiming to eat higher protein meals, I often use faux meats to meet my macronutrients. I stay towards cleaner products, but many have PUFAs, which is polyunsaturated fatty acids, and I know you say that causes inflammation. Could be this be the reason I'm not losing weight? Do I have to give these up to reach my goals? What are some better protein sources for vegans besides beans, tofu, tempeh? Thank you so much. 
I so value your work expertise, and I'm so grateful for the podcast and deep care for people's health. Thank you, Crystal. Appreciate that. All right. Let's help out Crystal. So um, a lot of things going on. PCOS, certainly that causes weight gain in many, many women. Um, and then you said it, you know, it resulted then in chronic dry eye and hypothyroidism. Well, just keep in mind, PCOS doesn't cause the chronic dry eye and hypothyroidism. The imbalance in the body causes PCOS and then it causes chronic dry eye and hypothyroidism. So it does sound like there is a um, cell membrane and hormone-based issue. It may be a blood sugar-based issue. If you were to run only one test, I would have you run the stress hormones mood and metabolism test. Again, you're, you're asking for why is this happening? And I'm saying that any practitioner that tells you why it's happening, they have no idea. What we can give you is, is very educated guesses, but we don't know. It can, we can give you an educated guess based on all the people that we've heard with your story that we've been able to help, right? So you could have estrogen dominance. You could have imbalanced blood sugar levels and higher fasting glucose levels affecting your overnight fat burning. You could have low levels of thyroid, meaning a TSH above a 2.5. Um, you could have low levels of vitamin D. You might have low cortisol output in the morning and high cortisol output in the evening. Uh, what else? What are some of the very common ones? You could have gut imbalances with inflammation. Your omega-6 levels to omega-3s might be a 20 to 1. Um, so yeah, all of that matters. I mean, all of it matters. And it could be the um, faux meats as well because they are lab created for the most part. They're, they're not healthy for the most part. <clears throat> so you're talking about vegan sources? Well, you've got hemp hearts, which are my favorite. That can be your lunch every day. Like you said, you've got beans and tofu and dal. <laughs> the tofu I'd be careful with because that could raise your estrogen levels. It's a weaker estrogen. It's a phytoestrogen, but certainly it could raise your estrogen levels, especially if you're if you're prone to estrogen dominance. So I'd be I'd be careful with that one. Um, you've got chickpeas. You've got yeah, all of those work, and uh, yeah. So I mean. It's tough for me to say because, of course, I want to help you. I want to say, okay, you're going to do a 21-day functional medicine detox. Then you're going to go into the fat loss city protocol, and you're going to use the daily nutritional support shake every morning. Remember, uh, Equal Life, 99% of our products are vegan, uh, only like the omega-3 and the adrenal energy support, and maybe like one or two others are. That's like about it. Everything else is vegan. So, I mean, that's, again, if you were just looking for a generic protocol, no, it's not generic. I apologize. That's definitely not the right word to use. If you were looking for a general foundational weight loss protocol, all right, daily foundational, uh, sorry, um, equal life detox for 21 days, then flex meal on day 22, then go into fat lossity level phase one, and then you move through that and you can do it as a vegan as well. So I highly recommend lab testing. I would run the big five. If you can't run the big five, I would run the starter kit plus the stress mood and metabolism. If you can't do that, then if I only do one lab, I would do the stress mood and metabolism because that is like the PCOS test right there. And it works at thyroid and adrenals and so much more. So that is how I would help you whether you wrote into the practice or not. And so hopefully that was helpful. Again, my goal is to just move you in that right direction. Remember, our health is a lifelong journey. Once we figure out one level, we take it to the next and the next and the next. That's what it's all about. So thank you so much for being a part of this community. I appreciate each and every one of you. Always feel free to share the show if you believe it could help someone else. And of course, I'll be back tomorrow answering six more of our community's questions. Take care, everybody.